somebody has just asked me the question about the modern state of Israel. I was quite surprised that hadn't come already when I was talking about redefined election, but there we are. Um, in, is there any sense in which the state of Israel founded in the late 1940s could be the fulfillment of biblical prophecy? Now, I, I taught at the Hebrew University in 1989. There's at least one person in this room who I was um, close to in Jerusalem at the time. Um, and the Hebrew University on Mount Scopus has this amazing corridor with larger than life-size pictures of the returning exiles in the 20th century. Jews making the journey from Eastern Europe and so on. And all around, they have quotations from Isaiah and Ezekiel and so on. And the shrine of the book at the Israel Museum with the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, has the central, uh, the, the central plinth of that is a facsimile of the text of the Isaiah scroll. And the whole thing is focused on the establishment of this state is the fulfillment of prophecy. So, I mean, I've, I've seen that close up, how that ideology works. And, and it, it's, <clears throat> it's a great ideology within the modern Zionist movement, and it has no basis in Christian reading of scripture whatsoever. I'm very clear about that. This is not what Romans 11 is all about. Astonishingly, and I say this in the Paul book, um, astonishingly, in American culture, it is taken for granted that Paul in Romans 11 predicts the return of the Jews to the land. And my evidence for that is a piece in the New Yorker a couple of years ago about Michelle Bachman, who was going to be a presidential hopeful. And they ran this piece on her and talked about her fundamentalist beliefs and they said that this picks up from the fact that in the New Testament in Romans 11 Paul predicts that Jews will return to their land and when I read that I thought you know the New Yorker used to employ people called fact checkers um, <laughs> how did that happen um, but it's, it's, it's deep in some bits of American culture and the rest of the bits of the American culture just accept that that's how it is and it really really isn't Paul says all the promises of God find their yes in him and actually, part of the problem is that Western Christianity has so de-Judaized itself and de-Judaized its picture of Jesus that there is, as it were, a Jewish deficit left over, which then has to be fulfilled somewhere else. And instead, when we understand Paul's gospel Jewishly and Jesus as the Messiah, then this is how, this is how it is. Now, that's not to say that the state of Israel is illegitimate. That's a totally, totally different question. Uh, but it, 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 is, it is to say that you cannot say Israel right or wrong, you know, that, that we must support the state of Israel, whatever it does and, and whatever. That's very dangerous. That's I, I, ideology. That um, seems to be idolatry. Um, I'm speaking strongly, but, um, you know, I've, I've lived and worked in that part of the world and seen how that works, but I've also had this debate, and, and it crosses, you know, Jewish Christians, Messianic Jews, etc., etc. There are all sorts of different positions on this. Um, yeah, that's probably enough. I, I, you know, the way that the New Testament reads those prophecies, particularly Romans 8, emphasize the whole world is now God's holy land. That is what Romans 8 is all about. Yeah. You... That's an extremely important point given the hundreds of millions of dollars that are raised in the United States in support of the, of the building of the next temple and the red calf and all of the things that are oh, goodness. part of the, uh, the industry that is related to Christian Zionism in particular. So um, it's a very, very big feature of American Protestantism. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as with many other things, I think you will know that almost nowhere else in the world is this even thought of. Um, that, that there are many, many things which are absolutely endemic in, in American culture, which just don't even exist um, once you go elsewhere. <clears throat> That's not to say they're wrong. It's just to say, actually, foreign countries do things differently. <laughs> 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 I want to shift gears a little bit, not just from this morning's talk, but really in general to the wider questions that you've been raising, because in a certain way, what you've done is set out this uh, magnificent vision of the vocation of God's people in the world, which is to be the, the reflection and response, the embodiment in word and deed of, of this kingdom that is now here and, and uh, anticipated. And really the, the task of Fuller Seminary, as the task I would hope of any serious seminary, but certainly the task that we're reaffirming is that we are 
in the process of attempting to form Christian leaders for Christian vocations, understanding that to be multiple in their uh, expressions, but a shared vocation at the core of it, which is the sense of uh, the call to be uh, individually and communally an expression of the people of God. Now, that's a, pro a developmental process. And we talked on Wednesday night when we were having the conversation between you and Miroslav about some of your own formation. And I think that one of the things that's so uh, important about taking the next step with what you've been giving us over these days is really to ask how, given the fact that you know that you are pushing against <laughs> other visions and other types of formation that have led to other kinds and expressions of Christian discipleship, what would be some of the things that you would most wish would be an outgrowth of this work when you think about the process of Christian discipleship? Yeah, I, I don't have any kind of big strategic plan for this. I, I, I go back to very, very obvious basic things that we were all taught early on, that um, I don't think what I have said is a complete agenda for the present day. I, don't, I mean, it would just be bizarre if it was. I certainly don't think that this is an agenda which you can simply pick up and put down again 20 or 30 or 40 years from now. Part of the extraordinary nature of the Bible and of scriptural authority is that you is that every generation has to do its own homework on scripture i hugely value commentaries and 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 works on the bible from former generations but each generation has got to think it through and each generation will come with its own questions and has to do the hermeneutical thing of going to and fro on that so that um the key thing is that future leaders any christians but particularly future leaders should get as much of the Bible injected into their entire system as early on as possible. I say to my students, please learn this stuff while you're young because you'll then have it for life. When I try and learn something by heart now in my 60s, it's very difficult. The only way I can do that is by bringing it into lots of lectures and then it sort of sticks in the mind. But when you're young, the mind is plastic. And so seminary formation, I know that now people come to seminary at all ages, but it seems to me that the formation Obviously, you do lots of other things as well as Bible, but um, there's always a danger in seminaries that we add so many other things to the curriculum and then we perhaps drop the minor prophets or we don't actually study um, Second Peter or whatever it is. We've got to have the whole thing because you never know which bit of the entire scriptural package is actually going to be the one which will catch fire um, around the next corner. And you do need to be able to handle the whole thing. So complete Bible training is, is the centre. and I mean, the other obvious basic thing, which we're all taught as children, if you're a Christian, is, is how to pray. And actually, prayer is difficult, and prayer is complicated because it has to do with our personalities, which are growing and changing and shifting. And often, many of us need spiritual guidance, a spiritual a soul friend, if you like, a, a spiritual director, who will help one to understand who we actually are, and hence both how it is going to be natural to pray at the moment, and how we might grow and mature and change and be crucified and risen in ourselves through different practices of prayer. And that will shift over time. And so I think a community which is being a whole Bible community, and which is being uh, taking care about, you know, it's so easy in seminary because we, we have this line in England that, that a good chap doesn't tell a good chap what a good chap ought to know. So, you know, somebody comes to seminary, we assume this is a, a, a praying Christian. Are you saying your prayers? Yes, I am. And that's the end of the conversation. The answer is no. Okay, we will have you in a little group or we'll make sure you have a spiritual director and they will gently, wisely probe and help you to grow up as a person of prayer because it won't just happen by accident. It's got to be intentional. So the Bible and prayer, obviously. Um, and then um, from my point of view, I would regard the sacramental life as absolutely indispensable. You know, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, you catangality, the death of the Lord. Not just that you preach a sermon about it, but you're actually doing, claiming the space and time mm -hmm of that day or whatever for the Lord with this action. And we Protestants, are, Western Protestants, are so worried about doing anything in case it turns into human works righteousness. You know, we, we really need to get over that one um, and, and accept the glory of heaven and earth coming together. So 
this is very, very basic, I know, boring and obvious. You probably wanted something much more sophisticated, but Bible, prayer, sacrament, and, and ministry to the poor. Um, Matthew 25 remains hugely important. Um, one of the rabbis said that um, the beggar's outstretched hand is the altar of the Lord. That, you know, okay, there are other ways you can help people on the street than necessarily giving them 50 cents every time you pass by. However, symbolically, um, Matthew 25 is saying exactly that. Mm -hmm. So in that process of formation that you're describing, it, I'm just taken with the fact that in one sense, it's back to basics again. There's nothing magical about this. It's not as though uh, there's some easy way of finding some fast way of becoming a disciple. It's a, it's a slow developmental process in many ways. It involves a lot of the classic disciplines. Yeah, it, absolutely. And and as I say, each generation, it, it, it's like, you know, you may be playing chess with somebody and you may be doing this and doing that. At the end of the day, the game's over. The pieces go back on the board. You know, we may have this strategy, that strategy, the other strategy, but at the end of the day, okay, let's go back, Genesis to Revelation, <laughs> prayer, sacrament, service. Um, the other thing, of course, is teaching people how to read the present culture. Jesus said, don't you understand the signs of the times? Um, teaching people how to realize the agendas which are forming their knee-jerk reactions to things, the agendas which are out there in the different cultural movements of our time. You know, you in America have this thing called the culture wars, um, which the rest of us have sort of echoes of. Um, it's got nastier in my lifetime. I come to America a lot and it's got more, I would use the word vicious. It's sometimes really very nasty. How do you navigate that as a church? How do you have the debate wisely and lovingly? How do you do the Philippians two, one to five things in a church which is likely to be divided by that. And if the answer is, you leave that church and go somewhere else, then the answer is, no, that's just escaping the problem, not addressing it. I know that's not easy. But um, things are changing so fast. I, I can't keep up. When I was Bishop of Durham, I did quite a lot of cultural critique because I was in and out of all sorts of bits and pieces in the House of Lords and so on. And I would try to be doing that. The last four years, I've been... Uh, basically back in teaching New Testament studies, and I'm, I'm out of touch. I'm not watching many movies. I'm not reading many novels. I'm just getting back to Jesus and Paul and Revelation and so on and loving it. But I'm, I'm aware that now if I'm asked, and I've got to do this in San Francisco this next week, speak on something about the Bible and tomorrow's world or something, now, I can do that, but I'm always worried that I'm not even up with today's world now because it's changing so fast. Mm. And so we do need a generation who will understand where the music is going, what why, why is the music doing this? Why is art doing that? Why are the media doing what they're doing? Um, what are the cultural movements? And then how to address from the life of prayer, scripture, sacrament, service, how then to address the culture. And, and again, there is no easy blueprint for that because as the culture changes, so it isn't just that you'll add a few more movies or novels or whatever to your course. The course itself may need to change. Mm -hmm. But whatever well, we get to after postmodernity, who knows? Right. Well, I think one of your, what you're describing is really also a process then that goes on. I'm thinking again exactly. of many people here who exactly. are already clear about what their vocational calling is. They're in the process of living it out. But the process of their continued formation, their continued reflection. I, I'm just aware the number of times I'm in settings for pastors will say that they have no time for prayer, no time for reflection, no time for community, uh, among other things. And as a consequence, there's this sense of disconnection from self, disconnection from the world around you, and then a wondering about how it is that the ministry doesn't necessarily find either satisfaction in their own life or necessarily in the, in the work and ministry that they're doing. Yeah. The barrenness of it yeah, yeah, can yeah, wear yeah. very, very thin. Yeah, I mean, the basic disciplines are the basic disciplines. My uh, colleague when I was in Durham, um, a bishop has often somebody that is called a chaplain who is um, usually quite a senior priest, clergy person, um, who is there to be the bishop's eyes and ears and assistance and make sure everything happens and, and sort of be a gatekeeper and so on. Um, my chaplain for the last four years I was there was a man who'd been trained in a rather sort of middle liberal tradition. But one of the things that he'd been firmly told at college was if you're going to be a vicar in a parish, turn your dog collar around, um, you say the daily office, whether you want to or not. You get up in the morning and you do morning prayer, and in the evening you do evening prayer. And that means Old and New Testament readings as well as the, the prayers and the structure. And he was told, 
there will be many times when you don't want to do that, but you must do that. And he said, looking back uh, after 40 years in the ministry, he was in touch with lots of his contemporaries who'd been at college, and the ones who had made shipwreck, who'd given up, were the ones who stopped saying the offices. And it's very basic, and it's very gritty, and it's kind of boring, you know. We all wish there would be something more exciting and sort of flamboyant. And No, it's very basic. You get up in the morning, and you get the Bible out, and you do the, you do the stuff. And uh, to give that up, um, you might as well resign the job. And I'm very serious about that, because, you know, you're running on empty. I'm, I'm really encouraged by what you've just said, but I'm also struck by the fact that that is intersecting in this context with a culture that tends to measure pastoral ministry by success and pragmatism, by standards of, of output. And, I know. and I that's know. just such a different instinct. I know, I know. I have a friend in a different state um, who um, was working in a large church for a long time. They've got a new senior pastor who went entirely onto statistics and how many people turned up and, and so on. And the Bible teaching and all that ministry just diminished in proportion to, and uh, it seems to me that's just cutting off your nose to spite your face. And, and this, this is difficult because, yes, your whole culture is one of the reasons that Maggie and I love coming to America because you, you get off the plane and you can, you can feel things happening, people getting out there and doing stuff and making it happen. Whereas you get off the plane in the UK and people are saying, oh, well, we could have done that, but the right time for that would have been 1967 and we didn't do it then, so let's not bother, you know. Um, it's, uh, and, so, and it's always time for tea. It's always time, absolutely, yes, yes, I'll drink to that. Um, but, um, the, the, you know, so that the can-do culture is wonderful and God can use that and has used it mightily and I honour that and respect that and love that. That's why it's, it's such fun coming here. Um, but the danger then is, yeah, the measurement that you... and church success is not measured in numbers. Um, and this is very difficult. I had a clergyman in my diocese whose congregation had dwindled from 120 to about 10. And I'm not sure why those 10 were still there. Um, and he, he came to see me and I, I had to say to him, you know, this church, this church isn't viable. It's not paying. And I got full blast that I was only saying this because I was an evangelical and, and, and well, Bishop, you're, you're an evangelical. You like big churches and all this sort of thing. I'm not in that tradition. And, and uh, when our Lord took three disciples up the Mount of Transfiguration, are you saying that wasn't a valid experience, et cetera, et cetera? I was thinking, um, I don't think I even want to be in this room. Thank you very much. Um, there are times when and there are ministries in which God will be powerfully at work, but the numbers will not increase. And that may be for demographic reasons in that area. It may be for all sorts of reasons that God is doing a new thing there, which will take a generation to go deeper. And then in God's good time, maybe under a different ministry, it may broaden out. We have to have the humility as leaders and as denominational leaders to be prepared to see that happen. It is difficult because churches have to pay their way, give or take. Um, and big churches, if you're in a denomination, don't like being asked to prop up what look like failing churches. But there's failing churches and there's successful, but you wouldn't notice it, churches. And, and that's, that's difficult to discern right. pastorally. Right. We're thinking a little bit in this final session about the future of the church again. Yeah. And nobody here is a soothsayer of what that's going to look like, I realize. But when I think about one of the great challenges that are, that's before the church, especially perhaps the church in North America, is this issue of how uh, faith and confidence in the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ combines with action in the world. And the way the paradigm has played out in a lot of the American church is the sense that the grace is almost the enemy of works, and certainly works are the enemy of mm -hmm. faith. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that we so easily slide from faith to works as opposed to faith to action. And we make one a kind of quite, a, quite, you know, quite, a benchmark for quite. spiritual success. Can you comment on that? I, I think what's happened, again, is the taking of Protestant rhetoric from the 16th century and then seeing it through the lens of the Enlightenment agenda of the 18th and 19th century. How does that work? It works because the grace works antithesis of, say, Luther, which already in the Reformed tradition was being severely nuanced. Um, you know, Calvin wouldn't have had any truck with a therefore there's nothing to do mentality, nor would Luther actually, to be fair. Um, but that grace works antithesis is then heard through or seen through or in the light of um, Lessing's ugly ditch, the division between the eternal truths of reason and the contingent truths of this world, or within a Kantian idealism, 
um, or just within old-fashioned Epicureanism, where our business is with this distant God who we happen to have a hotline to because he once invaded our world and then has gone away again and we're going to go and be with him. And so all of that means this world is irrelevant. And that's an enlightenment agenda which the church has colluded with, which was a way of saying, really starting in the second half of the 18th century, that spirituality, Christianity, religion is precisely by definition not to do with this world. It's uh, otherworldly, present spirituality and future hope and nothing to do with this world. Therefore, we will carve up this world and do with it what we want. And we will let that just happen. That's Epicureanism. And we shouldn't collude with it. And so, so it's a common, and this is why I say we need to understand where these ideas have come from, because when people say, oh, that's just works, or you're do and it's the same reaction to the sacramental world, and it's the same reaction to, to whether you call it social justice or whatever. I don't like that phrase because it implies an antithesis. And then you read Matthew 25. And you say, um, Jesus seemed to think this is really rather important. And people then diminish that. Oh, oh this just means other Christians. No, sorry, I just don't think it does. Um, and uh, so when we understand where our rhetoric has come from, then we can go back to the first century and say, actually, the Grace Works antithesis was always a bit more complicated than that. And it certainly doesn't play into or sustain that heaven and earth dualism of Epicureanism. And so, but, but this is a matter of teaching. It's a matter of, because as I say, we've all got a default mode. And if we're not careful, we flick back into it without even realizing. And we have to address that head on. We need new philosophical theologians at every level, not just seminary level, but parish level and people to reflect and discuss and say, no, that isn't actually the way the world is. Here in this Psalm, here in this bit of the gospel, here in Genesis, Revelation, we have a rich heaven earth duality, which we have to live with. I, I think that that is one of the things we talked to, again, briefly about on Wednesday night, which is this, the attraction of Pope Francis is an example of a person who brings uh, heaven and earth together. That's part of the attraction, yeah. right? You suddenly see a vivid example and people across the denominations and outside the church entirely look at someone yeah. like that yeah. and say, oh, that's, that is attractive. That right. is hope right. 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 That feels as though it's actually real to yes. us. Yes, yes. Why, why can we see that, be drawn to that and still fall prey to these practices that just end up dividing again? Oh, it's this propensity to sin. Um, you know, the, 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 the natural human tendency to mess things up, which whether you call it original sin or give it some other name. Um, and and it's, it's partly laziness that, um, and this is the difference between virtue and vice. Did I say this the other night? I said it somewhere else. Perhaps it was when I was in Phoenix. And the difference between virtue and vice is they both become habits, but the way to make a vice a habit is not to think. It's just to go into free float, floating mode. And then stuff that you're just doing will get you in its grip. With virtue of whatever sort, that only happens when you're thinking about it and making the hard intentional choices. Virtue is like practicing an instrument, which is very difficult. You know, C minor harmonic scale or whatever it is. That's really difficult to begin with. But when you practice it, eventually you'll meet one of those in a Beethoven sonata and it'll just happen because you've practiced. But you had to think about it first so that then you don't have to think about it later. Um, so often we in our modern world, um, we believe in authenticity in spontaneity, which is the attempt to get the results of virtue without the hard work. The results of virtue is that things do just happen naturally, they become second nature, but you only get there with the hard work up front. Um, sorry, it's a little mini bit of a lecture, which I'd hoped would actually get into this last lecture, but there wasn't room, because um, it's about inaugurated eschatology again. Um, so that... Uh, we need to do that hard thinking about how all this is going to happen so that it will be second nature to Christians, to churches, to do this stuff. Because that's, it seems to me that that's putting its finger on one of the reasons why so many people are so deeply disaffected from the church, because it feels as though the church has its own evident vices yeah, and sure. no, it seems, remedy to those vices sure, because it sure. seems to just simply be the sure. mirror of the culture that's around us. Absolutely. But, I mean, it is wonderful to see that even a lot of people who are disaffected, all it takes is 
a one flicker of Pope Francis or whatever, and suddenly those people, they still have a yearning for right, the reality, right. and they'll know the reality when they see it. And actually, yes, Pope Francis is very exciting. I had the privilege to meet both of his predecessors, and both of them actually are very exciting people in their own way. Um, Benedict Ratzinger got a lot of bad press um, earlier on, but actually a remarkable theologian, a remarkable human being, and a man of, of, of real humility, I think. And John Paul um, II, even in his old age when he had Parkinson's very badly, um, he was still enormously beloved and was a symbol to many people of a man who was faithful even though his physical world had closed in on him. And many people saw that as a real sign of hope. Mm -hmm. yeah? That reminds me of an experience I want to share and then have you respond to because it seems to me that it's continuous with what you're describing. Uh, it happened that the one and only time I've ever been at the Vatican, I was at, in St. Peter's. Uh, I could see that something was happening, but I couldn't see what it was. It wasn't clear that uh, what was going on. I tried to ask people, no one spoke English. So eventually I sat down, eventually the lights went on and up rolled John Paul II. Uh, uh. And uh, the cathedral went crazy. People were screaming and yelling. He was very advanced by this stage mm -hmm. in his Parkinson's. It was within about six months of his dying. Uh, uh, uh. And as he came by me, he was really very visibly drooling. Now, I found this really a profound moment because it seemed to me that here was this person that in their, his public role of leadership, he was at, at the height of his symbolic leadership at the very least. But in a Roman Catholic context, you could have a pope drooling. This is not what low church Protestants do, right? Uh, we, we will never see Billy Graham drool. We will never see... Uh, many beloved, highly regarded yeah, people yeah, yeah, yeah. drool yeah. because we have, I think, yeah, this yeah, disassociation yeah. between body and spirit uh, and... Uh, 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 uh. But, it, but it's interesting, but the disassociation and yet we want our leaders to look like our yes. sort of leaders. Well, exactly. And I mean, I go back to Mark 10 again and again, Mark 10, 35 to 45, where Jesus says, listen, the rulers of this world do it this way, we're going to do it the yes, other way. Yes. They are the big upstanding people exactly. who go around sending in the tanks, bullying people, bossing them about, etc. Right, right. And we are going to be servants. Right. And the whole vision of, of a pope teaching us how to live and how to die. Yeah, yeah, well, exactly. Is exactly. an example of of a exactly. call to a different sort of Christian leadership. And one, and, one of the, and, and one of the things that JP2 had done, I mean, one time I was in Jerusalem and it happened to be the same time as he went to Jerusalem and he went around, he, he completely upstaged everybody by going around apologizing and by going around praying at the Western Wall and by um, going to places that they never expected he'd want to go to. And it, there was a wonderful sense of humility and reality about it, um, which the Israeli hosts just didn't know what to make of it. And it was it was just a lived bit of gospel. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was quite extraordinary. So, uh, let me just say, since we're talking about JP2, Maggie and I were there in early 2002, I guess it was, in Rome uh, for a few weeks. I was teaching at the Greg, and we had the chance of an audience, and he was reasonably far gone. But what happens with a papal audience is that there's a photographer there, and everybody that shakes hands, beautiful photograph, and it's waiting for you at your residence when you get back there afterwards. We got these photographs. One of the kids, my kids, when we got back home to, to London, put the photograph in the frame on the front hall of Maggie, my wife, shaking hands with JP2. And they put a caption which said, not everyone gets to meet the most exciting person in the world, but it was John Paul's lucky day. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we are coming to the end of our, our time, and the conversation could go on for uh, hours and hours, um, and you've already given many hours to us. So um, I do want to just say, uh, Tom, how really deeply grateful I am and we are that you have you. been here. And for the fact that uh, the vision that you are, are doing everything you can to help instruct us and many other people in is a vision that comes so deeply out of what I think uh, I agree is the heart of the biblical teaching and the heart of God. And I receive it in that way. And I think that we do, otherwise we wouldn't be here. And there's, there needs to be, as you invite and have entered into yourself, lots of good vigorous exchange about concerns that Christian life and practice and theology have yet to settle. And every generation has to keep working on it. This generation, mm -hmm. our generation has to keep working at these things. But what you're offering us both by your teaching, your writing, and by 
your personality and your gifts in simply being willing to be approachable and engage us is more of a gift than, than you perhaps know. <laughs> so at the risk of being too American, I just want to say uh, <laughs> not about JP2, but about you, <laughs> that, um, that you are uh, a person of great grace and truth to us. And we have been enormously enhanced by your being here. Well, thank Thanks you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you.